So I'm very honored to introduce our first keynote speaker for this first session on integrating disciplinary practices. Um, please note that this session is being recorded. So Dr. Nicole Becker received her bachelor's in chemistry from South Dakota State, uh, which was followed by teaching high school science in Namibia. From there, she returned to Purdue to pursue her doctorate um, with a focus on chemistry education. Uh, following her doctorate, she did a postdoc at Michigan State working with Melanie Cooper, which ultimately led her to the University of Iowa, where she currently runs a chemistry education research group. Uh, so I'm excited to hear more about some of the deep thinking she's been doing with her research group about how students engage in the modeling process. All right, so Dr. Becker, I'll turn it over to you. All right, so <laughs> thank you, Brian, for the kind introduction and good morning, everyone. Um, so today I'd like to share a bit of work my research group and I have done to look at student thinking about distribution graphs in chemistry contexts. Um, so why distribution graphs? Well, we think that these are important because they are uh, ways of modeling important particulate level concepts in chemistry. Um, one important concept is what's been called the varied population schema. So the varied population schema is the idea that the particulate level components of a system vary with respect to different parameters, such as kinetic energy or velocity. Uh, this idea contrasts with the homogeneous population schema, a view that system components are uniform, um, which is a common alternative conception among high school and general chemistry students. Um, shifting from this homogeneous population schema to a varied population schema has been described as something of a threshold concept, um, an idea that makes new ways of reasoning possible that were not possible before. Uh, so for example, when thinking of particles as having the same speed, it's really difficult to explain things like probabilistic phenomena like chemical reactivity. Why do some particles react and others don't, for instance? However, students who conceptualize system using the varied population schema may develop a better understanding of the relationship between variability of motion and kinetic energy at the particulate level and connections to chemical concepts like reaction rate. So in the study I'll talk about today, we were particularly interested in, in students' ideas about distributions as modeled graphically. There's cons a considerable body of literature related to students' graphical reasoning in chemistry and in science more broadly. And this body of work highlights the complex nature of graphical interpretation and the difficulty associated with connecting scientific principles to graphical representations. Um, now, in a general chemistry course, a typical graph might look something like this, uh, where there's something like a plot of concentration versus time, and there's some chemical process taking place that might cause the change that's seen in the graph. Here, skills and behaviors such as attending to variables and focusing on the relationship between change in the, in the variables, covariational reasoning, is foundational to understanding processes modeled. And in most cases, focusing on X and Y and how they change is a productive strategy for interpreting a graph. Um, however, there are cases where students are provided representations that are intended to be read differently. Consider, for instance, histograms, which are very similar to the probability distribution graphs that are the focus of this study. Um, it's been shown in a mathematics context that students tend to map time onto the x-axis when interpreting these graphs, implying that there's some process happening. In a chemistry context, there's a growing body of research related to how students reason about other graphs that cannot be read straightforwardly using covariational reasoning. Um, for instance, reaction coordinate diagrams. Um, so these diagrams show snapshots of the energy of reactants, products, and transition states in a chemical reaction. Reaction coordinate diagrams are best understood as one-dimensional um, because in these diagrams, horizontal distance, uh, that is like peak width, for instance, does not encode meaning. Um, and this is an idea that is often not explicit to students. As discussed by Popova and Bretz, for instance, students also tend to think about this type of graph by imposing time onto the x-axis and by attending to what experts would consider surface features that have no real meaning, such as the width of a peak or the length of a horizontal line segment. 
There's also evidence that students may map conceptual ideas onto the shape of graphs, much like they do the patterns in mathematical equations. Um, building on the idea of symbolic forms, which relates to assigning a conceptual idea to a symbolic template in an equation, the construct of graphical forms has been developed and applied to chemistry contexts to characterize the idea students assign to graphical patterns. Um, for instance, Rodriguez and colleagues found that general chemistry students associate this type of curve with titrations, um, regardless of the context of the data, just based on the shape. So we know that students do things like attend to surface features that an expert would consider irrelevant, uh, map time onto graphs where it doesn't fit, and map processes to different graph shapes. So how are we making sense of these different types of observations? So next, I'd like to talk a little bit about our theoretical perspective that informs how we are interpreting students' sense-making with graphical representations. So as a theoretical lens for this study, we adopted DeSessa and Sharon's coordination class theory. According to this perspective, a concept can be viewed as a system of strategies for gaining information and a network of knowledge elements known as a causal net that can be used to turn information readouts into inferences. Coordination classes help an individual to see a concept in the world or in representations like graphs. In this sense, the coordination class acts as a filter where information is the input from a question, a scenario, a problem, etc., And the output is then an inference or conclusion pertaining to the concept of interest that allows an individual to address the prompt. Our rationale for using coordination class theory is that it provides a fine grained account of both the ways in which students attend to features of uh, graphical representations and the knowledge elements that are activated in different contexts. Um, coordination class theory has previously been used in various contexts, um, including physics to look at students' ideas of wave pulses and velocity, and in chemistry to look at students' ideas about light matter interactions. What we're interested in, though, is the relationship between students' readout strategies and the concept of interest, which here is the varied population schema. So that is, we want to describe whether and how students are able to see the concept of varied population in distribution graphs. The sophistication of a coordination class is commonly described by the constructs of span and alignment. So span relates to the broad utility of a coordination class to draw inferences across seemingly different contexts. For example, if, if students were able to draw conclusions about reaction rate in two different problems, one with kinetics data in a table and another with kinetics data presented graphically, this would be an indication of high span. Alignment relates to the extent to which students attend to different features of the problem but arrive at the same answer. For example, if a student was given reaction versus time data and arrived at the same conclusion about rate by plugging values into the integrated rate law versus using the data to plot a graph, that would be an indication of high alignment. As part of the study described here, we consider the extent to which students activate knowledge elements related to the varied population schema across different representational contexts. For example, if a student's coordination class related to the varied population schema had high span, we would expect that they could apply the concept across multiple contexts, including reasoning about a group of molecules in a flask or reasoning about distribution graphs. On the other hand, high alignment would be reflected in a student's ability to focus on different features of a prompt, for instance, different aspects of a graph, but in each case reach the same answer. To illustrate the idea of alignment, uh, consider a study which involved investigating the development of students' ideas of velocity and frequency in the context of oscillatory motion. Before instruction, middle and high school students used an intuitive idea of fastness when thinking about the velocity of a pendulum. Um, and this was described as uh, an intuitive coordination class. By attending to the distance traveled by the pendulum and attending to what was more consistent with their idea of faster means more, students incorrectly arrived at the inference that longer pendulums are faster. 
Conversely, when looking at representations of motion versus time, the same strategy, noticing what was more in the graph, led to the inference that shorter pendulums are faster. So we see in this case that the intuitive coordination class and associated readout strategies for fastness was ineffective at helping students arrive at consistent inferences across contexts. Um, in, in this study, I will note that there was an intervention using a computer simulation and following that intervention, students reasoning did become more normative with students making distinctions between velocity and speed, suggesting restructuring of the intuitive coordination class associated with fastness towards new distinct coordination classes associated with velocity and frequency. Okay, so let's talk a bit about what we did in our study and what we found. So for this study, we were interested in a type of graph that's commonly used in introductory chemistry sequence, uh, distribution graphs. We wanted to know in what ways do students interpret and make inferences from probability distribution graphs, such as the one shown here, showing the distribution of kinetic energy in a molecular level system. To examine students' ideas about the varied population schema and their relationship to distribution graphs, we interviewed 12 chemistry students enrolled in the second semester of a general chemistry course. Uh, most students in the study were in the first year of college with the exception of one second year student and one third year student. Um, I'll discuss student responses to a subset of three interview prompts uh, from the interview. In the first prompt, we provided students a scenario in which neon gas was placed in a sealed flask at room temperature and constant pressure and asked them to describe and sketch what they imagined was occurring within the flask. Next, we asked students to predict what would happen if the temperature of the flask were raised by 100 degrees. Um, this first prompt, which has no graph, was important for our study because it provided information regarding the extent to which students considered particulate level variation outside of the context of, of graphical representations. In the second interview prompt, we showed students a distribution graph for the same sample, which showed number of particles versus particle speed. We asked students to describe what they thought the graph was showing, with follow-up questions addressing what students understood by specific graph features, like axis, peak, area under the curve, etc. cetera. Uh, then we asked students to sketch how a graph would look if the temperature of the sample were increased. In the third prompt, we pre presented students with a distribution graph showing number of molecules versus kinetic energy for a chemical reaction carried out at two different temperatures. The distribution plot yielded uh, or included a vertical line near the tail of the graph labeled as activation energy. Uh, we again asked students to explain what they thought the graph was showing before asking them to predict which line would correspond to the faster reaction and why. Our data analysis was informed by the phenomenographic tradition and was aimed at capturing the range of ways that students attended to the graphical representations, uh, that is the readout strategies they used, and the cognitive resources activated, that is the knowledge elements activated. So we coded interview transcripts using inductive analysis to identify themes in readout strategies and knowledge elements used by participants. And we used a constant comparative approach to iteratively refine the codes and definitions as we identified themes. Our refinement of the coding scheme was interleaved with construction of, of what's called resource graphs to help us visualize the data. So resource graphs are visual tools that represent the inferred relationships between knowledge elements activated and the relationships between them. Typical resource graph, graphs involve circles indicating knowledge elements with connecting lines or arrows indicating relationships between ideas. Um, for this study, we constructed resource graphs to represent students' hypothetical coordination class structures with verbal discussions, written work, and the use of gestures uh, serving as evidence from video data, um, as evidence of readouts, knowledge elements, and connections. We constructed two types of resource graphs for each participant's response. Uh, the first, expanded resource graphs on the left could be described as composite resource graphs because we constructed them by comparing the ideas a participant discussed across the three interview prompts. 
Um, and the goal of the expanded resource graphs was to provide a fine-grained account of students' conceptual structure for the varied population schema and its relationship to other ideas such as kinetic energy. The second type of resource graph we constructed on the right, we refer to as condensed resource graphs. Uh, construction of condensed resource graphs involved extracting key features pertaining to the varied population schema from each expanded resource graph and denoting what inferences students were able to make so that we could more easily compare student reasoning across participants. So here, the knowledge elements are represented on the left side of the arrow and the inferences on the right. And the goal of the condensed resource graphs, again, was really to allow us to see patterns more easily across participants. So I'd like to walk you through an example of how we constructed the expanded resource graphs, since I'll, I'll talk about these quite a bit. So here, the blue triangle represents a readout and a yellow circle represents a knowledge element. Um, again, we used both verbal and written records in order to infer readouts and knowledge elements activated. As evidence of connectivity, we looked for things like linking words like so and because. Um, in, in some cases, the connections were implied rather than explicit. So for instance, discussing an average involves the assumption that there are multiple values. Um, so here we have the dialogue of a general chemistry student we'll call Beth. Beth, you can see, initially attended to the neon particle behavior, which we characterized as a readout since it was something she focused on from the interview prompt. She described the neon particles as bouncing, which we characterized as a knowledge element. This idea of bouncing has actually been described in the literature as a phenomenological primitive, or P-prim, an intuitive idea that comes from students' interactions with the physical world. She also mentioned collisions, which is encompassed within the, the description of the bouncing P-prim. And she discussed random motion, which we characterized as a distinct knowledge element. So similarly, we can considered her idea of constant speed to be a distinct knowledge element. And this idea is connected to her readouts of constant volume and constant temperature from the prompt. So as I mentioned, the expanded resource graphs can be described as composite resource graphs, given that we constructed them by comparing the ideas discussed by our participants across the three interview prompts. So to illustrate uh, what the construction of these graphs looked like, here's Beth's reasoning for prompt one prompt two, and prompt three. You can see that some knowledge elements and readouts are activated consistently across prompts, most notably across all three prompts for her. Uh, Beth activates the idea that values, for instance, of kinetic energy vary for different particles. She uses this idea when talking about both of the distribution graphs and the sample of neon glass in a flask. As I mentioned, we constructed the re condensed resource graphs by identifying knowledge elements that pertain to the varied population schema specifically and that were common across participants. Uh, we also indicated the inferences made by students across the prompts um, as indicated by the arrow and circles to the right here. Again, the goal of the condensed resource graphs was to allow us to see general trends in reasoning across our participants. In our construction of the condensed resource graphs, we noted the presence or absence of knowledge elements and linking connections in a predetermined structure. This predetermined structure was based on the most expert-like reasoning we observed, which agreed with our own discussions of what knowledge elements and connections would be reasonable for a general chemistry student to make um, for the particular prompt. As I mentioned, we also indicated which correct inferences a student was able to make from the interview prompts. So here is a representation of all of the condensed resource graphs for our 12 participants. We noted two broad themes in students' readout strategies, their, their way of approaching the tasks. First, re viewing the graph as a distribution, and second, viewing the graph as a process. Students with reasoning guided by the graph as a distribution readout strategy recognized that values, for instance, of kinetic energy, 
vary for different molecules, which is knowledge element one here. Um, they also commonly identified the peak as representing the most common value and indication of central tendency. Uh, this idea is represented by knowledge element two. And they indicated that the breadth of the peak reflected the amount of variation observed in the sample, which is knowledge element six here. These students tended to use words and phrases like distribution, histogram, bell curve, and normal curve when descri describing the provided prompts. In contrast, students who viewed the graph as a process used fewer knowledge elements related to the varied population schema, and overall were able to make fewer correct inferences. To give you a sense of how students who thought of the graph as a distribution were thinking, uh, consider Dana's description of the graph in prompt two. So when asked how she would describe the graph, Dana describes the graph as kind of like a histogram almost. And she identifies that the y-axis tells how many molecules are moving at that speed at any given time. When asked to predict how the graph would look for a higher temperature sample, data inferred that the maximum would move over to the right towards higher speeds because more molecules would be at higher speed. Uh, the, and you can see that the graph drawn by Dana clearly shows a peak shifted towards the right. In contrast, students who viewed the graph as representing a process commonly described the general directionality and trend with phrases such as, as X increases, Y decreases. Uh, this kind of reasoning, which involved examining how X changed with uh, changes in Y is consistent with what Carlson and colleagues described as co-variational reasoning. Um, furthermore, students who viewed the graph as a process commonly constructed a narrative to explain the shape of the curve. For example, Ava justified the observation that neon seemed to disappear in the graph in prompt two by stating that neon atoms combined to form diatomic neon. She notes, so it looks like what's happening is maybe as kinetic energy goes up, there are collisions and more collisions and more reactions happening. And maybe neon is becoming like an elemental molecule. It's going from a single neon to two neons bound together. I can't remember if neon works that way, but that's the only, that's the best explanation I have because the number of molecules decreases as the speed goes up. And for non-chemists, I will note here that neon is what's called a noble gas. And this uh, scenario where two neons would bind together is highly unlikely. So it, it wouldn't happen. Now, when asked to explain what the graph would look like at a higher temperature, Ava wrote out a reaction to explain her reasoning. Uh, she said, so my thinking was that the graph would be really compressed, that the reactions would start occurring a lot sooner. I don't know if they'd start dissociating again, but this is what I'm confident, um, what I'm reasonably confident would happen. I just figured if increased kinetic energy caused the number of molecules to decline a lot faster, then temperature, since temperature increases, kinetic energy would just expedite that effect. So while Ava's proposed mechanism of change was incorrect, you can see that she does have some productive knowledge resources here. Uh, for instance, she associates higher temperature with particles having a higher kinetic energy, for instance. Um, but because she was reading the graph as though it corresponded to a process, her ability to draw correct predictions was impeded. So next, let's take a look at what these two ways of viewing the graph meant for the span and alignment of students' coordination classes. So here, we'll use the expanded resource graphs to compare responses from two students who used the readout strategies observed, Elijah, who used the graph as a distribution strategy, and Jim, who used the graph as a process strategy. Here's what their expanded resource graphs look like. Right away, you can see greater connectivity in Elijah's graph and what looks, looks like some fragmentation in Jim's. Elijah's graph as a distribution readout strategy enabled him to make correct inferences. Uh, for instance, drawing conclusions regarding the average of the distribution plot. Elijah said, the highest peak is at that value of speed that we're getting the most molecules in the neon vessel. We have the highest number of molecules moving at a specific speed, but the average is likely to be close to that. 
it would be fairly close to the right of the peak. Yeah, it would curve down, but I feel like that has more of an effect on the graph by shifting the actual average speed of the molecules towards the right. Um, so here we can see that Elijah observed the lack of symmetry in the distribution and noticed that the tail end of the curve, uh, the graph curved, um, readouts that informed activation of knowledge elements related to the varied population schema, such as values vary for different molecules and peak as a central tendency. A closer look at Elijah's knowledge structure reveals certain knowledge elements have more connections, such as a higher temperature, higher speed, uh, which was important for helping him to make inferences. More importantly, the idea of peak as central tendency and values vary for different molecules had a large number of connections in comparison to other knowledge elements. So that trend of well-connected knowledge structures related to the varied population schema was consistent across other students who used the graph as a distribution readout strategy as well. Um, furthermore, similar knowledge elements related to the varied population schema were activated in all three prompts for Elijah um, and most of the other students in this category, reflecting a, a, the stability of the varied population schema across the different contexts in the interview prompts. And this is an indication of high span. In contrast, Jim, uh, the student who used the graph as a process readout strategy responded differently to the task with the sealed flask of neon in a verbal context compared to when graphical representations were shown. So this is an indication of limited span. He activated the idea of values vary for different molecules in prompt one, the context without a graph, but he did not activate this idea when talking about prompts two or three, the contexts with the graphs. So from Jim's expanded resource graph, it seems that he activated two disjointed knowledge structures. The knowledge structure on the top reflects the ideas Jim used to reason through prompts one, and the knowledge structure on the bottom reflects the ideas he used to reason through prompts two and three, the two contexts with graphs. There was really no evidence of connectivity uh, across his ideas from prompts one and two and three. So we conjecture that these disjointed knowledge structures in Jim's expanded resource graph reflect a less stable knowledge structure related to the very population schema as it was not consistently activated across prompts, which means low span for the very population coordination class. So like Ava, Rather than using the varied population schema to draw inferences about prompts involving distribution graphs, Jim consistently used covariational reasoning to interpret the graphs provided, focusing on how X and Y change together. Jim said, if the number of molecules goes higher, the speed would decrease. And if the number of molecules goes lower, the speed would increase. His molecular level rationale was, because as the number of molecules goes higher, they would bond together more, which would make them go faster. While if there's not a lot of molecules, then there would be nothing pushing them to make them go faster. So overall, Jim's reasoning here can be characterized as revolving around a centralized causal process that involves the notion that increasing the number of molecules causes an increase in speed. So in addition to issues with the span of students' knowledge structures, students who used the graph as a process readout strategy exhibited reasoning that was less consistent with respect to drawing inferences, reflecting a lack of alignment. So for example, when discussing prompt three, Jacob was asked which of the re reactions depicted would result in a faster reaction rate, the reaction at T1 or the reaction at T2. Initially, he focused on the height of the peaks and responded that T2 would give you the higher rate of reaction. Since, it, since this original increase in the number of molecules isn't as high as the T1 graph. Jacob's subsequent discussion, however, uh, seemed to imply that since there were fewer molecules for the reaction at T2, less energy would be needed and the reaction could go faster, which is incorrect. However, later in the interview, Jacob changed his position uh, once he attended to peak width. Uh, Jacob said, yeah, I guess I'd actually say T1 would be faster if you think about the width of the points, 
like I'd say this point right here would be pointier than the point for T2. So it'd be a quicker transition or the transition state would be, it would take less time than for the T2 reaction. So here, Jacob seems to associate peak width with a relative amount of time, implying that he's mapping time onto the x-axis. And as can be seen from this discussion, when Jacob extracted different information from the graph, his reasoning yielded distinct and conflicting outputs, indicating a lack of alignment. So this trend of conflicting readouts resulting from more fragmented reasoning helps explain why fewer correct inferences were observed among students who used the graph as a, a process readout strategy. So to recap, uh, reasoning rooted in the varied population schema allows students to draw rich inferences about phenomena from graphical representations and make connections between concepts. To summarize our findings, we observed that although students recognize that variation exists in a system in general terms, um, that is different molecules move at different speeds, they tended not to connect this idea to distribution graphs. When provided with frequency distribution graphs, such as number of molecules versus speed, the students tended to interpret the graphs in a way that's analogous to graphs typically presented in chemistry. Um, as speed increases, the number of molecules increases, for instance, um, often implying a linear relationship. So uh, students need more support in recognizing that distribution graphs are intended to be read differently than other graphs. That is, there's no causal relationship between X and Y, and students need support in explicitly connecting this representation to the variation observed in a system. Our findings also highlight the context specificity of student conceptions and the need for scaffolding to new contexts. Um, so how do we as instructors support students in extending and using their ideas productively? Uh, well, first we observed that even students who expressed fragmented ideas still had productive ideas that could be potentially leveraged. Nearly all of the students, for instance, activated the knowledge element that values vary for different molecules at some point in their interview. Um, but they didn't necessarily use this idea when reasoning about graphs, for example. So we posit that one route towards extending the span of the varied population schema in graphical contexts is the idea of peak as a peak of a distribution as central tendency. If students are able to read the peak as an indication of grouping rather than as an event, this could serve as an anchor to attach subsequent ideas. One route towards supporting this may be to use examples of distribution graphs with scenarios that students are likely to be more familiar with, um, such as, uh, as sort of an orientation to distribution graphs. Uh, for instance, a distribution of exam scores might be one example. We argue that being explicit about how to interpret graphs like distribution graphs and allowing students space to renegotiate how to interpret them in chemistry contexts is really critical. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. I'd also like to acknowledge the people who have worked on this project. Uh, Dr. John Mark Rodriguez, a postdoc in my lab, and Avery Stricker, who's a recent graduate, uh, recently graduated undergraduate student, uh, were the key people on this project to date. Um, and with that, I would welcome any questions you might have. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Becker. That was amazing. Uh, we do have some questions showing up in the chat. I'll give you just a second to take a sip of water. Um, a quick, easy one that Joe Redis asked was, uh, first fascinating talk, can we have the list of references, please? So one thing just to note is that the uh, keynote talks will be posted, the videos will be posted from those online. Um, in terms of, and then somebody was kind enough to put a paper that references these in the chat. So if people want to pursue that further, there's a published paper that covers some of these ideas. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to add to that, Dr. Becker? Yeah, and certainly if you want to shoot me an email, I'd be happy to provide other references and resources related to this work. All right. The next one from Kim Castens or Castens, apologize if I pronounced it correctly. Have you tried showing their resource diagrams to individual students 
and asking them how well they recognize their own thinking in these diagrams. Um, I am thinking of the teaching strategy of having students make concept maps, which are similar to your interpretive diagrams in some ways. We haven't done that yet. Um, I think that's a really interesting idea. And I'd be curious um, what the result would be, because a lot of the times some of these connections between ideas are somewhat implicit. Um, so I'm curious if students would, would recognize that they're able to connect these ideas. So it's a good suggestion. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. Um, from Joe Dower says, this is fascinating. I'm curious how these change over time. And I'm assuming by time you mean uh, as a student develops, uh, as opposed to other kinds of time. Uh, are they more interconnected? Do they prune unnecessary or unused knowledge elements? Well, we just have a newly <laughs> awarded NSF grant that will enable us to do longitudinal studies where we'll be looking at how students' ideas about um, distribution graphs and the varied population schema evolve um, over the course of their participation in general chemistry. So that's a question we've also asked ourselves and we'll be looking at soon. Very good. So stay tuned on that. Uh, this comes from Drew Rosen. Is there a thought to changing the way students or we label axes, like labeling the y-axis, quote, number of molecules at a particular temperature slash speed, unquote? That could be a good uh, instructional scaffold, I think, um, for students who are learning to interpret new types of graphs. Um, I think that it's probably something that won't change in scientific practice, but for instructional contexts uh, to get them used to thinking about particular aspects of uh, a graph. I think that could be useful. Yeah. Uh, there's a question that came privately to me on the side. Uh, so this question is, uh, do they have a sense of what type of instructional strategies the students from the two general groups, uh, meaning the groups that are viewing the graphs as a distribution versus viewing the graphs as a process, um, what are these two groups experience in, term of, in terms of learning the concepts of molecular motion, speed, and kinetics? So they um, were all enrolled in the same class, and so presumably they've had, um, other than their chemistry coursework at, at the high school level, they've had the same um, ex exposure to instructional resources um, in their general chemistry courses. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Yeah, I think so. So here's a question um, related to kind of background math knowledge from Clarissa Keene, uh, wondering if there could possibly be a connection between students' distribution versus process, re versus process reasoning, if this could be correlated to their level of math education. That's a great question. <laughs> we, for this study, we're really focused on the qualitative aspect. Um, and since our sample size was low, we didn't try to make any correlations between things like um, incoming math preparation and um, what sort of reasoning they use, but that would be a, a nice idea for future studies, I think. This question from uh, Nicole James wanted to know more about their uh, prior instruction on the topic. So specifically, this person is interested in knowing if students were likely to see simulations showing variations in individual particle properties like speed. Yes, they did see simulations. Um, the class used simulations um, in the homework platform, Mastering Chemistry, um, as well as simulations in class. Um, and so they, they had had at least been exposed to that kind of, of representation. All right, there, and there were a number of uh, kudos in the chat, people thanking you, uh, people saying great talk and so on. Another one from Molly Griston. Is it common for students to introduce time dependence looking at the graph as a process when it is not necessarily a graph over time? If so, is this unique to time or does it occur with other variables? Um, it is very common and it's been documented across disciplines that students do this introducing time and thinking about time on the X axis. Um, I'm not sure if it's specific to time, um, but I, I think it probably is fairly specific to time. 
Um, I don't know offhand of any other variables the students do that with. I also had a personal question that I'll throw in the mix kind of related to one of the earlier questions about representation. Um, I was kind of curious how you thought maybe student reasoning might change or sort of how stable student reasoning is um, or robust to, to changing features of the graph, like changing the line curves to like histogram bar distributions. Um, would that be, would like playing with those sorts of representational elements could that tell you about some of the, you know, where, where they're queuing on graph features versus where they're queuing on prior knowledge? Yeah, um, I think you could definitely find something out about like the stability of the coordination class for uh, relevant concepts like the varied population schema um, by doing that varying of the, the features of the distribution. Um, I think that, that that would be something really interesting to look at, for sure. All right, one more question from Elizabeth Day. This one reads, thinking about the student who suggested any two molecule, it doesn't seem like the student understood what a plausible outcome was, as if the variation across molecules doesn't really invoke molecular behavior, but instead as particles, billiard balls. How does a student's mechanistic reasoning of why two molecules attract impact their probabilistic reasoning? That's a great question. And I don't know that I, I have the answer for that. Um, I think that these are two really important areas. So like that students are engaging in causal mechanistic reasoning in a way that's, that's good. So they do have some resources related to causal mechanistic reasoning. They're just applying them in contexts where they don't necessarily fit. Um, and so I think the, the key is perhaps making distinctions as to where one is best, uh, most appropriate for activating versus another. All right, and we'll maybe close with one more question from Akanksha Angra. Thank you for that wonderful talk. I teach graphing and biology, and I'm curious about how students transfer their knowledge between disciplines. And so I'm sure we'll, we'll be curious to hear what Dr. Becker says, but then maybe that'll be a seed for later small group discussions. Yeah, I think that's a really great question. I think uh, my, my personal sense is that what we think of as transfer isn't as straightforward as we want to think of it. Um, so if a student learns about a histogram in one context, it doesn't necessarily mean that it, it transfers to probability distribution graphs in chemistry. I think there does have to be time and space for students to sort of renegotiate, well, what is this thing? How do I interpret it? And how do I connect it back to my, my chemistry knowledge or my biology knowledge? Um, so that, that renegotiation, I think, is really important. Awesome. All right. Well, please, everyone, thank, join me in thanking Dr. Nicole Becker for that wonderful talk and all the work from her and her research colleagues.